April, are you think we're ready to get started? All right. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, our first coffee and conversation, uh, going over our community engagement benchmarking study and some of the findings within that. Um, I'm excited to say that this is like one of the first um, pieces of work that was actually on our 2020 plan. Uh, while much of the year has gone completely haywire, uh, following up on the survey and um, sharing the results and talking a bit about how Life Science Cares can continue to support all of you in your CSR evolution um, is something that, that we're uh, committed to and excited to, to bring to the forefront this morning. Um, before I introduce the team that we um, worked on this with, I just want to thank all of you who are on the call that participated. This effort started last fall um, when we surveyed a number of our member companies to get a sense of what they were doing when it came to community engagement and philanthropy. And um, this is really a milestone for Life Science Cares. We seek to be a resource uh, for all of you and also companies who are um, interested in, in launching something in community engagement and don't know where to start. And so for us, this um, this tool is going to be evolving and, and hopefully useful. And so we're excited to share a bit of the results and also have a conversation with you all about how we can um, collectively do better. Um, so it is uh, also my pleasure to introduce the team from Slalom who generously uh, worked on this project with us pro bono. We've been really excited to have their really smart minds and consulting framework on, on, our, um, on our topics. Uh, so you ha we'll have with us today April Ferguson, who will be presenting much of the, the data and the results. And Tai Wo is on here as well. I know I saw you somewhere, um, who's been uh, super helpful in supporting April's work and in helping us think about some exciting future programming, which we'll talk about towards the end of the call. Um, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll start just with a, a little bit of background. I mean, I think most folks on the call are familiar with Life Science Cares. We really are um, built as a platform to help connect companies and employees around a mission of fighting poverty. And so one of the um, underlying goals in that is to really help build the muscle in community engagement and uh, philanthropy right in our local community. Um, that has been our mission the last four years, but it became critically important this spring, uh, first in the COVID-19 pandemic, and then with the racial and social un, uh, injustice that we've seen around the country. Um, we have been really proud to be able to pivot and support and work with many of you to bring resources where they really need to be right now. Um, so we, uh, well, while some of the data that we're presenting is you know, six or eight months old, we feel really strongly that the um, results and some of the conclusions from the work is gonna be helpful in thinking about how we grow um, community engagement in our industry more broadly. Great. So, um, so good morning, um, April Ferguson. Um, as Sarah mentioned, both Taiwo and I um, were really honored to, to work with Life Sciences Care on this, this project. Um, started, as, as Sarah mentioned, about a year ago, and you know, we were looking for ways that we could help, help support. And one of the things that she had been hearing um, from all of you is you know, really looking to understand more of what your peers are doing um, across the industry so that you can learn from each other and generate new ideas and, and think about how do you continue to evolve your programs. Um, so we can't, with that in mind, we had three objectives that we identified out of this. One is to empower each of the member companies, regardless of your size, with new practical ideas that will increase the impact of your programs. The second one is really just to set a baseline of um, what models of philanthropy and engagement looks like in the industry um, and really focused here um, in, in the Boston area as well, um, even more so. And then third, um, use, the, use this as an opportunity to start driving connection among all of you um, so that you can learn from each other, learn best practices and, and really 
you know, look for areas to align with each other as well as with life sciences cares. So we have kind of three, we broke the project up into three, three phases. Uh, the first was really developing a maturity model around this. So creating a framework that every company could use, each of you could use to look at and really kind of assess, assess your own programs and give you thoughts on where you might want to go next. Uh, the second area was around data collection, and that included, as Sarah mentioned, we um, conducted the survey. We also did some in-depth interviews with, with the sampling of companies as well. Um, and then finally, you know, pulling all that together um, and reporting out the analysis. Um, and that's what we're sharing today. And obviously, after, after this session, um, Sarah will be sharing out the report um, itself as well. So that you'll, you'll have it, so don't feel like um, you have to take a lot of notes here. Uh, we will we'll make the content available. Um, before I go on, just Sarah, if you can keep an eye on any of the, the chat or um, make sure that I'm sticking with the timeline, um, just, you know, shout if you, if you receive any questions or anything, I'm happy, happy to take them along the way. Sounds good. So, so we started by asking, you know, what are the different, what are the major areas in which resources are provided um, for community engagement. And we identified four, four categories. One is around program management and governance, right? And that's really focused on the people, processes, tools to make sure your program is sustainable, that it's aligned to company goals and that you're allocating appropriate resources as needed. Um, and what we have found, and we'll, we'll share with us later in this presentation, is that, you know, as you look from early stages um, of a program, right, and as you start thinking about scaling it, program management and governance becomes um, even more important, right, because it's the decision-making framework that you have to make sure that the decisions you're making, where you're allocating budget, people, time, it's fully aligned with the longer term vision that you have for your program. The, the next three areas are really kind of the direct areas of giving. And the first is financial, right? This is, this is money. And whether it's provided by individual employees or um, by the company, could be through programs like payroll deductions, company match, um, that is all bucketed in kind of the financial category. The second one is volunteering, which is the investment of time. Um, and this could be, you know, participation in one-time events, or it could be, you know, ongoing board participation of some of the executive team. And then finally, we have this bucket around donations, and this is the giving of items. Um, so oftentimes we hear about things like coat drives, food drives, and that's the bucket by which we, we are calling donations. Um, it is important to note, and I should have noted this earlier, so the focus of this is really, this project was really about community engagement. Uh, we fully recognize that many companies, and I would say most companies, really start their journey with a patient, patient focus, um, getting highly engaged with um, patient advocacy groups, for example, and looking for ways to give there. That was not uh, within the scope of this particular study. So we were really focused on um, outside of patient giving. And when we talk about donations, we're also excluding product donations as well. So uh, the focus on this, like I said, was really about community engagement. So after we went through and said, okay, here are the, the, the different categories of giving that we want to benchmark let's take a look and develop a maturity model um, across each of these. And what we've defined is a three, kind of a three-tiered maturity model, um, going from startup to focused to leading. And what you will see across each of these is really just the level of structure around a program. Um, and oftentimes it's, you know, you'll see alignment with resources that are available, right? So, if we look at industry here in Boston, obviously we have a lot of early stage companies. So we fully expect that within the Boston area, we're gonna be probably more in the startup to focus range, right? But we know companies continue to grow all the time and we, we, we do have you know, some larger 
leading companies as well. So we wanted to factor that in um, as well. So if we look at you know, program management and governance, um, and I'll just work kind of across here quickly just to get you familiar with, with this maturity model. When we talk about program management and governance at the startup stage, it's really you know, grassroots um, and tends to be employee led. Um, budgets may be provided on an as, as requested basis. As you start moving move into focused, you might start seeing things like employee-based action committees. Um, there might be some limited funding uh, provided to that company. And then as we move to leading, right, this is a full, full program. You likely have a team that is fully dedicated to driving the CSR program. And you will see that manifest also in things like um, annual reports. You will see the CSR program very prominently um, featured within that or with the company's website. You will also see, you know, multi-year planning in some cases. Um, at minimum, you know, we said there's at least annual planning in place, um, as well as kind of a focus on outcomes um, and, and metrics. When we look at financial giving, um, again, with startup, you know, this tends to be, you know, mostly on an ad hoc basis. It may be, you know, individual events around financial giving. Um, and then as we move, you know, to, to focus, you start seeing, you know, there might be one program, employee directed program in place. And that may be through um, like a dollars for doers program, or it could be, um, you know, we hear some companies are able to um, offer donations in lieu of holiday gifts and employees have an option to uh, opt into that. And then, you know, as you get into the leading category there, you'll see, you know, multiple programs in place for employee directed um, programs. So it's really just about, you know, scale at that point. Uh, when we look at volunteering, again, in the startup, Ad hoc tends to be uh, employee driven. Um, you know, there may be a few events throughout the year. Then as you move to focus, you get a little more planning in place, right? You might be looking at maybe a six month timeline, um, looking at and planning out proactively the, the events that you want to participate in. Um, and then as you get into leading in this case, you know, we've seen things like multiple days of paid time off to volunteer as well as active participation on boards um, within, within nonprofits. And then, you know, similar with donations, you know, at the startup level, tends to be a bit more ad hoc throughout the year. Um, and then, you know, as we move up the ladder in maturity, then, you know, we look at kind of that more planning um, and, you know, kind of that more intentional program of where you want to donate. And then with the leading, what we will often see is an ongoing partnership. So we'll see companies pair up with nonprofits as a, an on, through an ongoing partnership. And you will see that um, partnership show up in several events throughout the year. Any questions on that um, that I can address at this point before we go on? No? All right, so we'll move along. Um, yeah, so I just, first of all, I just want to thank everybody. As Sarah mentioned, you know, I think we had about 28 participants um, in the survey. Um, and we, I think, conducted probably five or six interviews um, as a part of, you know, coming out of that. So just want to thank all of you who, who participated in that and provided some really valuable Feedback. But I think what you'll see here, right, we, we did have a range of companies represented um, in the, the data collection as well. All right, so let's go through, you know, I'm not going to go into each of these bullets, but, you know, regardless of the program maturity, there were some common observations that I think we could make across each of the areas coming out of it. Um, you know, what I would call out in the program management and governance um, is that most companies really, you know, do have their programs incorporated with their company's vision, goals, values, etc. Um, but few are discussing it with their boards and investors. So we do think there's opportunity there to share that more with, um, with your boards and, and investors and, and 
share some of the great things that, that you're doing. Because we know, right, that it has impact on employee engagement, right, and, and satisfaction as well. So there's a good story to be told there. Um, moving on to financial, um, we did find that half the companies we surveyed provide employee giving programs. Um, about a third of those give through employee recognition programs. And um, three, three companies had the option of making that donation in lieu of a holiday gift. So definitely some other ideas there that, that came out that we think could be um, shared across companies. Um, and then, you know, in terms of volunteering, um, you know, nearly all companies, you know, participated in a volunteer event at least annually and over half um, actually sponsored their own events. So um, that was pretty exciting to hear. Um, about half also maintained calendars. Um, and, um, you know, looking at, you know, planning out some of those volunteer activities. And about a third, you know, plan six months or more in advance. And then in terms of donations, um, over half the companies that responded do make donations. Um, and of those that make donations, half are doing it through a planned event. Um, and that, like I said, could be through a food drive or donation um, or a partnership. Um, and then in terms of sponsoring charitable events, almost all uh, responded um, that they do sponsor at least one charitable event annually. Um, and there were several who, who focused on sponsoring multiple events throughout the year. All right, so what I'll do over the next the next few slides is just share with you um, at each of the maturity levels, um, just some, some ideas that we saw and kind of the, what we heard um, from some of the companies that we would place into those maturity levels. But, so the first one, you know, we talked about startup and not surprising, right? These are, this is the largest group of respondents that we had given if you think about the demographics of the industry here in Boston. Um, most are early stage companies, um, have limited resources to invest, um, but a ton of employee enthusiasm and community engagement. So what we see here often are grassroots pro um, programs with high degree of employee participation. Um, and, you know, there's very little to no overhead. And what we think is that this creates a lot of opportunity for employees to develop leadership skills through, through their programs. Um, in terms of, so, so a great example of this is Wave, Wave Life Sciences. Um, what they had shared, shared with us is they do um, take a lot of pride in their um, programs that they have, their patient-related programs, where they offer, um, they sponsor patients to go, DMD patients to go and participate in camps, for example. Um, they also have some ad hoc events where they participate in Earth Day cleanup. Um, what they look for in their Life Science Cares partnership um, is, is ways to supplement some of the, the patient-focused programs that they're doing. So they really value in being able to tap into Life Sciences Cares, have events kind of ready, out of the box. They can just show up. It requires very little planning on their part. Um, and it allows them to start supplementing this patient-focused program with getting more involved in the community. And as they are thinking about their future and where they want to they they want to grow uh, their program. They do want to get more focused on getting engaged in the local community um, in the Cambridge area, and that's where they value the Life Sciences Cares partnership uh, to be able to do that to get connected and understand where are the needs and where can they help support. Um, in terms of future planning, some things if if you believe and and keep in mind. Um, a company may not be fully in startup. So for example, you, some companies um, might be considered startup within financial giving, but if you look at volunteering donations, they may be at um, a focused area of maturity. So, you know, certainly don't feel like you, any, your company is necessarily fully in, in one level of maturity, but there is flexibility across the board. And this is really just kind of the framework to, to inform planning. 
Um, so when we think about future planning, what are some things, right? And these companies are really looking for low cost, high impact activities. And some things that could be done there is working with Life Sciences Cares on a lunch and learn, you know, with a service activity to engage employees. And um, obviously in, in light of COVID, um, we do think that there are some ways to, to do this virtually and, and we'll share, we've got an idea, something that we're gonna be um, planning over the next couple of months that we're really excited about and we'll, we'll share that um, later, later in this um, coffee chat. Um, the other thing, you know, company, company drives uh, as well as fundraising campaigns, right, with a company match or a challenge to employees. In terms of the support that you can get from Life Sciences Cares, um, you know, given their visibility into what companies are doing, I think they have a great perspective on helping you build out what an annual calendar could look like, um, helping you to coordinate events with their partner organizations, as we mentioned, um, like how Wave taps into that, um, you know, and it allows your teams to show up, focus on being impactful and kind of less about kind of the broader, broader planning. Um, and they can also provide templates, right? How are other companies managing their program? What are some, you know, success metrics just to get you started? Um, they're a great resource for, for that. Sarah, any other thoughts? Uh, anything else you would want to mention for, for this group? Um, just, I guess, for this group and the others, I mean, the, the um, considerations for future planning, you know, certainly Life Science Cares wants to be a partner with all of you in this. Um, but I also have to say we're, um, we are sort of committed to and integrated to the larger community and the larger context. And so if there are ideas from folks in how we might um, build that community or support you all we are we are very open to hearing that I think you know we've we've been so encouraged by the early success but realize there's so much more we could be doing to um, to help uh, to support these efforts yep. <clears throat> great all right let's take a look at the, the focused uh, level of maturity um, this is the second largest group, again, not surprising given the demographics we have here, here in Boston. Um, so these tend to be companies that are often early stage or what I would call recently commercial. Um, and they're starting to make some investments in their program. They do have some budgets um, and they are really thinking about scaling their organization. So as companies move into this, right, this is where that program management and governance becomes super important because you will now have more resources, whether it's more, um, more employees, more budget, and to make sure that those are allocated in a way that's aligned with the objectives of your programs, it's important to have some of that, that structure in place. Because um, this is really about moving from grassroots ad hoc to really be being more intentional with where you, you allocate those, those resources. Um, so when we look at this, you know, a great example uh, is Moderna, right? And as Moderna is getting closer to becoming a commercial company, you will see um, the evolution of the CSR program. And, you know, I would say they are on the verge of moving from focus to leading. Um, a great example of this, if you have not been out on their website, um, they do have a white paper um, outlining their CSR program framework. Um, and it's a great example, right, of, of putting that structure in place, knowing the areas of giving, whether it's environmental, community, um, STEM programs, um, you know, defining what that framework looks like and where those priorities are. Um, so I would encourage, you know, everyone to go out, take a look at it if you haven't. Um, it's a great example and it's um, something to think about for, for your own programs as well um, to make sure that you have that plan or that framework defined because as your companies continue to scale um, or if you're in a company, right, that is, is looking at scaling, right, having that planning up front will make sure you're ready um, at that point in time and know that when you do get those additional resources, know where you want to direct them. 
Um, in terms of consideration for future planning, um, you know, what we see here is further alignment with, with company goals. So as I mentioned, identify what are the priorities of the program? Um, you know, is it to support STEM? Is it focused on, you know, significant unmet needs? Establishing metrics um, that measure the impact of your program. Um, how is this impacting your employee satisfaction? How is it you know, impacting communities so that you can communicate that back to leadership. Um, because obviously, you know, what you will want is as the company is um, moves to commercial, there are, you know, some, some funding becomes available, starts opening up opportunities for you. It will be important for you to be able to make that business case of the value that your program is having on the company. So putting those metrics in place, um, engaging you know, senior leaders in your program will help to make sure that you continue to get the support that you needed. Um, another thing that we've seen here, uh, we see companies starting to think about ways to automate. Again, when you're starting to think about scale, um, it becomes much harder when you're working off of manual processes and emails and spreadsheets. So things like um, you know, being able to automate employee giving, such as like company matching or cause cards, um, just makes it a little bit easier to do so that your teams aren't focused on executing those programs, but you really get the opportunity to free up some time and, and focus on, on other areas and, and make a bigger impact. Um, in terms of, you know, what support, some, some thoughts here on how you can get support from Life Sciences Cares. Again, thinking about that business case, I think Life Sciences Cares could be a great word resource and helping you articulate your program story and the impact that it's having within the company, right? How do you measure, how do you align um, your program with employee engagement, for example? How do you make that connection? And how do you demonstrate that every dollar invested in the community engagement program has, has impact on the broader company goals? Um, and then as well as you know, connecting you with other program leads. Um, so I think this is a valuable resource and this is something that we talked with Sarah about um, coming out of this. And you know, as we mentioned before, this is just the beginning, right? Um, I think it would be great to provide more forums such as roundtables to allow each of you to connect with each other and share kind of the latest of what you're doing and um, have a conversation that's relevant for where you and your company are with your program. So the last, um, the third level of maturity here is in the leading category. Um, not surprising, this is our smallest group of respondents, but we had about 18% um, that we believe fell into this category. Um, this is a pro, this, you know, tends to be, um, as you'll see here, you know, we Biogen um, clearly in that, uh, as well as Alexion. And these are programs that are really thinking longer term. Right, so they are looking beyond planning the next year, but really thinking about the next few years. Um, they tend to have, you know, advanced tools in place to manage because they have that that scale, um, and there is a need for more um, robust tools to to manage that scale. Um, they they also um, what we see is more of an integration between the financial and time based giving. So the example of like a dollar for doers program where um, employees actually get sponsored to go and volunteer. So we're starting to see some integration between their, their, their categories and the way that they're making that impact. Um, for many of these companies, you will see a foundation established um, that's really focused on, you know, having a defined mission and focused on that long-term giving plan. So again, really thinking about that longer term sustainability for the program. Um, and the other thing to note here is that often these companies will um, do have a, a company, sponsor, company sponsored day of service. Um, the examples that we, we have here, um, one of course is Biogen. I'm sure many of you have, have heard about this program. You know, they really have this innovative program where they donate kitchen space um, for the food for free meal prep. Um, 
The other thing that I found that was really just incredible is that they match employee giving up to $25,000 a year, um, which I think is just amazing. Obviously, you know, it's hard for, for many companies um, to be able to offer that, but I, you know, I think it's definitely worth acknowledging and, and recognizing. Um, and then Alexion, if you go out to their website, they do have a CSR star branded program um, that defines their, their program's value proposition. Um, for all of the company stakeholders. So again, another resource I would highly um, recommend, go out, take a look at it. Um, a lot of great information and ideas coming out of that. Um, but as they look, you know, even within this leading category, there is still opportunity to, to grow. So if you look outside of the Boston area, outside of industry and think about what do CSR programs really kind of really global um, leading companies, what they're doing in terms of their CSR program, we're looking at companies like J&J. &J. Um, and it's really incredible to think about, they have a 10 year plus um, planning or vision. So if you go out to J&J's website, you will see that um, they have a vision 2030, right? So they're not looking just at the next year or the next five years, but they real, really are looking at 10 years out. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about these companies is that they look to bring different skill sets together, both internally and externally, to tackle um, some of the world's most complex problems in innovative ways. Um, you'll see, you know, J and J, they are tackling issues like tuberculosis in developing countries, um, as well as providing um, support to mothers who are in developing countries to ensure that they have healthy pregnancies and, and births. And they're doing it by introducing technology. Um, again, you know, technology is not J&J's core, you know, what they focus on, right? They're focused on consumer health, but they partner with other companies, develop technology um, to make a difference uh, in the world. So, you know, really exciting and looking, like I said, at some, some different skill sets to bring it together. They are actively engaged in, in framing societal issues, right? If you think about the work, um, the Gates Foundation, for example, you know, really kind of shaping and defining what those issues are. Um, so if we think of companies uh, who are leading, I think some of the other areas to think about is um, leadership participation in nonprofit boards, so getting actively involved um, with leadership and helping to shape and guide uh, some of these nonprofits through board participation. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, you know, previously Life Sciences Cares can be a great resource in understanding kind of the local nonprofit ecosystem, um, helping to make some of those introductions, identify where the most critical needs are. Um, and as well as connecting with external partners to bring some complementary skill sets. So if you do have ideas, um, being able to bring in some of that external support, partnering up um, outside of the company, perhaps outside of industry, to, to bring some of that innovation to uh, nonprofits who need it. So with that, I will pause and see if we have any questions. Hey, good morning. This is Alex Basala, Investor Relations and Corporate Communications for Collegium. Thank you for your presentation. I have one follow-up question. So you talked about how um, measuring your program is so important. Could you please give some specific example around metrics that you're seeing what companies um, are using? Yeah, so I think if um, what, what we found um, programs that are earlier earlier stage tend to focus on like volunteer events. How many participants do you have? Um, um, how much time? How many events? So it tends to be kind of quantified. Um, but I think as you start maturing, I think what you want to think about is how do you measure the impact of those programs, right? So I think it's a very easy starting point is to look at kind of um, what we would call like lagging indicators. Um, the level of employee participation, right? Did 50% of employees participate, you know, in a, pro in a program over the course of the year? Um, when I think about C 
slalom, we have one very easy thing that we measure. We ask every employee to volunteer two hours every year. It's a very, you know, should be a very easy bar. We offer employees the ability to go and volunteer um, outside of the company and report back, you know, that they have volunteered. But, you know, we really aspire to have 100% participation. That's a fairly easy thing to measure and um, something that we are, are proud of, um, that every employee gives back to the community um, at least once a year. Um, so the focus tends to be on that. Um, obviously, you know, I think on the financial, it's very easy to, to measure how much is, is given um, throughout the course of the year and just what types of programs. Um, but I would think, you know, as you mature, I think what's even would be even more interesting is to understand impact on employee engagement, for example. So if you do start measuring, you could start with a start with an initial benchmark, right? And then as you introduce these programs, you can continue to do a pulse check on employee engagement, for example, and you can measure, um, you know, you can survey employees to understand the relevance of the community engagement program. How important is it to them? And how much does it drive their own satisfaction? So I think there are different ways to do that. Um, obviously, you can do surveys are, are pretty easy um, and being able to do those pulse checks. Um, the other thing that we do within slalom is on the anniversary at every employee's anniversary um, our ceo sends out a, a survey and it might be five questions very simple um, to gauge uh, employee satisfaction so that hits them once a year does that help yes thank you mm -hmm. any other questions Okay. Hi, this is um, Brendan Pyers. I, I work for uh, El Nylum Pharmaceuticals and um, the uh, on the internal communications team. And um, I, I, I have a question just about sort of the evolution, like through each phase. What is what what do um, sort of the resources look like from a personnel perspective? So, how are you know within each phase? You know, what does that kind of look like? Um, how are companies kind of evolving in terms of who is sort of responsible? for, uh, you know, managing, kind of connecting the dots and, and sort of um, really helping to kind of drive their CSR programs forward? Yeah, I think, um, so like I said, at the, kind of the, those initial phases, you might have um, one person who represents like a lead, um, in a lead role, and it tends to be a volunteer, right? It's not typically like a paid position. Um, they might be supported by, you know, a committee. So for example, you know, I think of uh, WAVE, I think they had someone who led kind of an environmental team, right? So you take what are the interests of the employees and they really drive um, what programs are in place. And because of that passion, right, you'll see some, some leads develop, right? So if someone has a personal passion around STEM education, they might step up and really in kind of a volunteer um, plus one capacity um, to drive that forward. Um, as you start getting into that focused category, you might have a small team, could be I would say probably a team of one to three, right? That's like a paid position, full-time, fully dedicated. Um, and again, these, these aren't absolute numbers, um, but I, I'd say generally, right? You would have a, a small team. And then, as I mentioned in the leading, you would have, you know, you could have a foundation in place and you know, with structure around that. But obviously there is a range even within each of those levels. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you have any thoughts in terms of what you're seeing. Yeah, um, it's um, it's a funny question. Even as we were thinking about pulling together a list of folks for today's call, um, all of you are magical unicorns in your companies because very rarely do we see someone that has community engagement or social responsibility in their title. And instead, um, we're looking at a cross-section of folks who are office managers, um, in, in an HR role, in communications, internal, um, external. And, um, and there are a lot of different structures that we see um, to both kind of lead the community engagement function, but then as well to 
gauge kind of employee um, response and to actually execute. So um, in some organizations, there there's one person who's kind of chief cook and bottle washer and rallying the troops and providing all the administrative support. In other organizations, there's maybe a executive or a sponsor level person, but they essentially task a committee of folks to come up with a plan based on feedback from their employees. Um, this is one of the areas where I think uh, Life Science Cares is excited into diving a little bit deeper and just um, almost teasing out some different models to, to share with you all for how we've seen it done. Frankly, they all work. Um, it's there. I don't think there's like one best model. We um, we've seen all sorts of ways to keep this resourced and consistent. Um, but but I think depending on company culture and just really decision making processes, one structure might lend itself um, to a certain company over another. Makes sense. Thank you. I have a question for Sarah. Sure. Hi, RJ. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> um, this actually presentation could have come at a bit of time. Um, I just got added to our newly kind of community efforts over at T3. Um, so leading the Boston side. So this is actually really kind of got some really good ideas from this. Um, one of the things that I kind of really pinpointed on was kind of having to direct, you know, how companies are directing their focus, depending on kind of what they do, you know, and I think that's going to be very important for us. Um, you know, being able to connect with life science cares is great, but are we able to kind of direct our focus towards a certain organization if we do it through life science cares? That's a, um, a great question and, and um, something that it's important to, to know about us and, and frankly what the IRS requires of us. Um, so what we cannot do is take a contribution from you and just simply pass it through to a, a specific nonprofit you direct us to engage with. Um, that is the <laughs> the nonprofit version of kind of money laundering, right? right. Like we're not allowed <laughs> to be <laughs> to be that entity. <laughs> what we can do is work with you to direct around a particular issue area or topic. Um, so, you know, we have our regular grant making process every other year in our three areas of focus. We make decisions around how much we're going to invest in education, how much in basic human survival. Um, we do intend to um, use that process to get even more fine-grained. So, for example, this, this hasn't been discussed uh, at the board level or anything, but one, one thing we could do is in a year like this year, we could decide to put a racial equity lens on our, our grant making. Um, and so through our process could um, tip the scales for a particular issue area. Um, and then as you saw, we, Life Science Cares can create restricted funds like the COVID-19 response effort, which um, as you can imagine, those grant funds were not given out through our regular grant process, which is, um, a, you know, takes a couple of months in sort of due diligence and partnership with potential um, funded organizations. We stood up a more immediate response um, which at first was contained to our current partners, but also um, then we started taking recommendations for other folks who are really showing uh, critical relief in, in the um, basic needs during the pandemic. So um, this is an area where we're also learning how to flex our uh, capacity as a nonprofit. So look forward to certainly working with you and the team at T3, but, um, but all of you on the call to to figure out how we can really support and align with your company goals. And on the, um, on the volunteer side, I mean, we can, with, with your people's time and talent, we can absolutely direct that however you, you want us to. So <laughs> we can, uh, um, you know, if you, if there's kind of an overarching sense from your team that they're really interested in, um, you know, acting as tutors or whatever, we can yeah. we can certainly um, direct Perfect. that energy however we wish. Great, thanks, Sarah. Absolutely. Hi, this is this is Kate O'Malley from Moderna. Thanks, Sarah and April, for a great presentation. 
Uh, just building on the last point, I'm wondering if you all are seeing companies pivot their programs, their volunteer programs, and or their reporting based on everything that's going on in the world today and the shift to more virtual volunteering and focus on equity. Are there are there any new trends that are coming out that you could share a little bit with the group? Yeah, sure. Um, this is something we have kept a pulse on with our partners, um, both from a, you know, how are you thinking about using volunteers, but also what do the next several months look like and how can we actually have impact with your programs? Um, and that looks different as many nonprofits are having to really reimagine how they're providing their services and not short term, not temporary, but thinking about big transformations that, um, that will likely have very long lasting effects. Um, I can say at this moment, you know, in, in late August, there is a lot more company interest in virtual volunteering than there are opportunities to volunteer. Um, part of that is because what we would ordinarily be doing in September and October is working in and around schools with back to school programs, getting new tutors matched with students, getting guest speakers into certain enrichment programs. Um, but with so much uncertainty around what is happening with schools and what schools will look like that the that is very much on on the back burner um what we what we are start just starting to see is for our programs that have a more direct relationship with their students and don't have to go through a school system so an organization like bottom line that is speaking directly to their college students um they we're starting to see really solid plans for what this fall will look like and what their students will need so um, we were just talking with them yesterday about technology needs that they've really nailed down for, for their students um, and technology support uh, that their students need. So um, we're starting to get a sense from those organizations. Um, we also are starting to see some of the uh, more direct human service organizations bring volunteers back. They are in smaller group environments. Um, sometimes they're shifting the work kind of to the volunteer's home or central location. So, um, and Am you'll see this from Amber in the next couple of weeks, but Cradles to Crayons is starting to use volunteers um, to come to Cradles to pick up clothes, to bring back to their house, to sort and prepackage and bring back to Cradles. So different than showing up at the Giving Factory, but they've realized that they can't, that they need these donated clothes, right? And they need volunteers to, to sort them. So there's a little bit more logistics involved. Um, the good news is that we've seen, even just from our clean out the closet drive these last couple of weeks, that people, individuals have a lot of um, sort of time and motivation to support this stuff. Like they're looking for this stuff to do at home. And um, that's been really <laughs> very incredible as is, uh, it can be uh, highlighted by the state of my dining room and Amber's basement, which are filled with donations that companies and, and individuals have collected over the last couple of weeks. Um, but I, I would say we're still very much in flux. I mean, we are talking and Amber's talking to our partners very frequently to see, you know, how their needs are shifting, how they're thinking about what the next now really six to, to nine months looks like and how we can support them. Sarah, that might be a good segue to our next topic around the, the hackathon. Yeah. As I, as I think about it. So, um, Kate, thank you for teeing this up. Um, <laughs> totally, I'm, I'm paid, didn't, didn't set this up. But um, no, one of the things that we, we've, we've talked about um, coming out of this effort is how do, we, how do we offer a way for companies to get engaged, to bring you know, different skill sets, do things in a different way, knowing that we're all you know, virtual um, and there are you know, unique challenges around this. And uh, we came up with the idea of doing it, doing a hackathon. And if anyone has participated in, in one, it's a, it's a great way to have focused attention. It's a fun environment. Um, to bring people together to solve specific problems. So Kate, you know, you mentioned just the fact that we're all remote. Um, these nonprofits are probably each going through, you know, unique challenges and how do they get the support they need? How do they deliver services they need? 
And what we would love to do um, over these next couple of months is really um, allow Life Sciences Cares member companies to form teams, small teams, to go and, and come together and think about unique, innovative ways to solve some of these challenges. So we are going to be planning for a hackathon. Uh, we'll be working with Sarah to identify a nonprofit partner um, who could use some of the support. And then we will be facilitating um, this hackathon and asking member companies to form small teams um, of volunteers to come together and you know, drive some innovation that could be then taken forward. Each of these ideas will be, think of like Shark Tank, if anybody watches Shark Tank, right, there's going to be pitches and we're going to identify um, the ones that we think are, you know, we're going to be judging on feasibility, right, could it be implemented, how, how easy can it be implemented, um, what kind of impact is it going to have, um, how is it aligned to the issue that, you know, we're trying to address. So we're super excited um, to, to bring this and I think as you talk about um, impacts of COVID on some of these nonprofits, I think this could be a great way to come up with some creative solutions that they might not be thinking about um, today. I, for one, am so excited about this because I am too lame to know what a hackathon is or to ever have participated in one, but I know they are fun and exciting and um, actually provide innovative solutions to the questions that are being asked. And so I'm really excited that the Slalom team has agreed to help support us in this. They have worked in a number of areas to offer this sort of um, way to uh, brainstorm around solutions. So we're excited and we'll be following up with a, a timeline for you all if you're interested in putting together a, a team to, um, to, to launch the first Life Science Cares Hackathon. And ultimately we think we'll be able to do these on a regular basis. Uh, taking kind of critical capacity and strategy questions from our nonprofits uh, to help to help them um, face. I mean, certainly some of the questions they're facing because of the pandemic, but but even in normal times, most of our partners have challenges and questions around um, things that we know we can bring expertise uh, to bear on. So we're we're excited about that. Great. Well, it looks like we have about five minutes left. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk about the impact breakfast? Yeah. Um, just so uh, if folks ha haven't heard from us uh, yet, you you will be hearing from us soon. But we uh, have finally settled. We've decided that we will uh, host our impact breakfast virtually this year. We'll host it October sixth uh, at eight a.m. The good part about not being in the Marriott Ballroom is that we don't have capacity issues, and we're really excited to be able to offer. Um, to sponsors and participants, the ability to invite all of your employees. The program will celebrate the industry's efforts in the last several months, um, certainly around COVID and around some of our work in equity. Um, we'll hear from former Governor Deval Patrick, who's been doing a lot of um, thinking and speaking on kind of the intersection of socioeconomic and racial inequity and, and how companies and organizations can make a difference in, in greater Boston and beyond. Um, and we'll be hearing from our partners in some, we think, pretty um, new and unique ways. So if folks are interested, you can reach out to me or Christine for details, but we're excited to, to have quite a virtual celebration in October. And then last but not least, April referenced um, one of the things we would like to kind of launch out of today's program is a, a roundtable for CSR uh, practitioners. So um, we know many of you aren't doing this as a full-time job and we want to be able to bring folks together to, um, to talk about what your challenges are, how we can share best practices, certainly learn from folks like, like Kate and the team at Moderna and Johanna and the team at Biogen who um, have incredible uh, history and background in evolving their community engagement strategies and, and are also super, or we found them, super cooperative and willing to share their experiences. And so um, we will be virtually at first bringing folks together to, to have some of these conversations. So um, we'll follow up with all of you just to signal if you would like to participate in those discussions or if there's someone else in your team that you think would be, um, would be excited to attend. 
And that's all from me. Yeah. That's, Look at that. We did it. it. Just want to right on time. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just want to say thank you all for, for your engagement in this. This has been a really rewarding um, project to get more involved with Life Sciences Cares and get better connected with the nonprofits um, that they're supporting. So um, happy to address any questions. Feel free to reach out to Sarah or myself. Our contact information is um, within the deck. Um, any specific questions that you have as you have a chance to digest the report, we're happy to, to answer them. We'll be so sharing the, report, the recording and a, a call for folks interested in the roundtable uh, by email after the call. So look for that outreach from us. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, guys. See you soon. Thank you.